Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're discussing the importance of preventing poverty for future generations with our special guest, Josh Sello, CEO of the Bill Wilson Center. And Josh, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited to sit and talk with you about the future of the Bill Wilson Center and also to explore a little bit about your own background, how you came to this point of leading this august organization. It's an honor to be with you today, Mark. Thank you so much. Well, and and just just to uh, be clear, one of the reasons we know each other is because... Yes, uh, M. Oppenheim led the search to fill this position at Bill Wilson Center, so we are a proud partner of M. Oppenheim. Well, and, and one of the things that I thought was so interesting about this particular situation that I'd love to talk uh, about with you, because it really does have resonance for uh, nonprofits throughout various spaces is this transition that you've had to engage with uh, of an august, highly accomplished leader who has built the organization, whose board has a lot of respect for the work that was done, whose staff has a lot of respect. How did you come into the organization? How did you experience that from your perspective as you were considering a move um, and, and how did you make that decision, which some people would feel is risky, right? Oh, yes. We've all heard cautionary tales. You don't want to be the successor to a legend because, you know, that successor isn't going to last very long, all those old saws. How did you see that? So I have to say, from the very beginning, folks said to me, you know, you've got enormous shoes to fill. And I think that's true. I mean, Sparky Harlan is known for 40 years of real strong leadership, both as the head of this organization, but also as an incredible advocate for the needs of youth, young adults, and families in our county and in our region overall. I mean, she has history working here in Santa Clara County, but in San Francisco too. So I wasn't intimidated as much as excited about the opportunity to learn uh, from Sparky and to carry um, her tradition forward, knowing that I would approach the work in a very different way than she did, um, but also knowing that I could uh, connect with her passion, her deep connection, her, her understanding. You know, we had the opportunity to spend a week together in DC, my second week at Bill Wilson Center. So I was able to learn firsthand, see her connect with legislators and talk to colleagues and leaders across the country and get a deeper understanding of the fire that is in her belly and what has inspired her. I think, you know, at the same time as I want to carry on the tradition that Sparky built here over 40 years of leadership, the message from the staff and the board and even the leaders out in the community is we also want you, Josh, to uh, lead forward the organization in the way that it needs to be now. So working together with the staff and the board and the community, figuring out what are the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years of Bill Wilson Center look like? How does that meet the needs of our constituents and our community moving forward? And it might look different than in the past, but we're always evolving. We as humans are always evolving and our organizations need to evolve to meet the changing needs in the community. And I'm excited to bridge the past, the present, and the future. So one of the things that I think is so interesting about what you just said is that, first of all, you came to the tenure of Sparky as the person who's really built up this organization with respect, but not with some sense of inadequacy or awe. Awe mm. inadequacy, right? I mean, you basically looked at it as, wow, what a, what a series of accomplishments now. How can I not be Sparky Harlan Jr.? Absolutely. Because you weren't going to be Sparky Harlan Jr., right? You're There's gonna... no way. So talk a little bit about your background and, and, and the kind of, of journey that you feel uh, not only gave you the competencies to understand the programs and the constituents served, Mm -hmm. but also to now work with your team, the board team, the staff team to continue to build. But let's talk initially about sort of your own career trajectory and how do you how do you connect with the constituents that are being served mm -hmm. by the Bill Wilson Center? 
So I'm going to start with the second half of your question mark, because I think that's what inspired me to even consider applying for the position. Uh, you know, I am gay and I am part of the LGBTQ plus community. And that is the community that is part of who Bill Wilson Center serves. There's a huge overlap in terms of youth and young adults who are runaway, who are unhoused, and youth that are LGBTQ+. So there was a deep resonance of feeling like this, this was an opportunity for me to serve a community of which I'm a member. And in all of all the years of working that I've been doing in all my various jobs, I've never had that opportunity before. And, and I really wanted to, as sort of, I reached the middle to second half of my working life have an opportunity to give back to my community uh, in some way. I'm also deeply moved by the issue. Let's, yes. let's talk about that, though. Yeah. Let's talk about why so many young people who are member of the LGBTQ plus community end up having these issues of homelessness, dislocation, job issues, mm -hmm. tossed out of their family. T talk a little bit about that from your perspective. What have you seen that causes so many people um, from the community to require the kinds of services that you now provide? What it, what's yeah. going on in America? I think what you often see a lot of, so there's several different layers of challenge that uh, families are facing. So the first is you see a lot of intersectionality related to communities of disadvantage. So there's a heavy overlap as it relates to poverty um, uh, and then family challenges that result from poverty. And then on top of that, if you have a child who's LGBTQ+, an inability to manage or understand or even deal with the challenges of your child. You see a lot of stories of folks being disassociated from their families, um, pushed out of their families. These are also families facing food and housing insecurity. So it's another challenge. And on top of it. Also, uh, 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 so you, you talked about income, you talked about um, um, identity. Housing. Uh, you talked about housing. Are we also talking about race? Are we also talking about gender? Are we talking about uh, what other aspects here? You said intersectionality. Uh, continue continue that sort of discussion of how you view intersectionality. Yeah, you, you're, I mean, you're talking about all those, so race, absolutely, because we do see a large proportion of people of color who come through our doors and need our assistance. I think in many cases, you're also talking about cultural issues, different cultures approach sexuality, gender identity in different okay. ways. Absolutely. So you have all these different lenses through which um, uh, the experience of a young LGBTQ plus person, a young person of color is facing. And then on top of that, you have the external issues. You know, we're seeing a huge increase in the number of anti-trans bills across the country. It creates an environment uh, where children are less safe, where they feel less taken care of, where they have less access to resources. Um, it's a time when you need leaders who are who identify as LGBTQ plus to stand up and say, we're here. It's sort of like when I was in my early 20s and there was the It Gets Better campaign that was out there for a while. Um, you know, for, for a long time, especially as I was growing up, there were no positive images of gay people in the world. Uh, and people didn't even talk about gay people. Other, I mean, I grew up in the 80s. So other than the AIDS crisis, that was how the lens through which we viewed gay life. And we've come much further. But when I see nationally the conversation around anti-trans sports bills, you know, anti-trans bathroom bills, it's become this is the new you know, anti-gay of the 80s, again, and we do need leaders to stand up and say, this is not okay. If we want to interrupt the cycle of disadvantage, interrupt the cycle of poverty, we need to lift up our young people, not bring them down. And they need folks like the people here that I work with at Bill Wilson Center and other like-minded folks organizations to stand up alongside them and help them thrive, not just survive. I mean, you're also seeing the the rates of suicide among young LGBTQ plus um, youth are much higher than non LGBTQ plus youth, and and this is a travesty and one that we have to address. So, are you actually seeing people 
uh, moving young people moving from states where they where these laws are being passed, or 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 is that not something that you've actually perceived, where people have actually come to uh, to states or to municipalities that that seem to be more welcoming from their homes just because they feel uh, rejected and they feel disrespected and they feel uh, mm. upon an attack for who who they are. I know that when we look at the um, the countywide, when we look at like in the um, countywide unhoused data that's put out by the um, by the pit every two years, um, I know that in general the largest proportion of unhoused folks are actually have been living in the community for a long time. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure that we're seeing a huge amount of uh, migration across the U.S. Um, in general, most of the folks that we see are residents already of the greater Bay Area who are coming here, not necessarily transplants from other states. So, so the the intersectionality piece is is really about this combination of of lack of means, right, which mm -hmm. creates uh, insecurity, um, uh, social um, rejection, right, by by family that mm -hmm. might. Um, uh, conflicts with religious beliefs. There might be um, issues of of race that intersect, and so on. And 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 now you've got kind of a perfect storm of people who have experienced different types of trauma, and those end up being your clients. Is that is that basically where it comes down to? Yes, absolutely. And and I think the trauma piece has to be really highlighted because these are significant. These are young people who have faced a significant amount of trauma and are still working so hard to navigate the challenges that they're facing. I mean, think back when we were that age and all the things we were facing, it's already a time of so much personal change. And then layer on top of that, the high levels of insecurity um, that come with not knowing that you have a place to live, that you have a family and a support system. Um, one of the things I did when I first got started here, you know, only eight weeks ago, was I went around and I met with every team across the organization to learn about their work and to hear about their hopes and dreams. And I think what stuck with me was the stories of some of the young people that are still in many cases in touch with our caseworkers years after they have um, you know, aged out of most of our programs. I remember a story of a, of a young person who had no, had no parental support, was unhoused, um, didn't have uh, a social system to sort of fall back on, worked with one of our caseworkers to help them navigate into housing, into public benefit services, now is married, has their own family, has a house that they were able to purchase. I mean, this is an incredible story. And this is what happens when we provide a safety net. We provide folks that can walk alongside our young people during these times of great trauma to help make sure that they have access to resources to, to make it into adulthood. Well, and and it's it, it's so close to home. Um, you know, um, in in my family, there there are members who were uh, discarded by mm. their um, by their parents um, at fourteen mm. and mm. became unhoused uh, in, in in that context. Um, I employed people um, who uh, many of whom uh, fell fell into some of these categories in their younger days and. You know, with with appropriate support, they become tax paying, job holding, you know, house owning, you know, uh, members of society. I, I, and that's what you're doing. You're you're actually trying to provide support. You're not trying to be codependent forever, creating a dependency. Mm. You're actually trying to bring people in and then exit them from your your uh, support into independence. How do you how do you strike that balance? So I like to think of the work that we do, and this is similar to work that when I was at West Valley Community Services, this is how I sort of thought about it in my head. We are we are champions, we are partners, but the folks that we work with, our clients, have a huge amount of work that they need to do. It's their journey. We are on their journey with them. And it's, and their job, there to right? it's, it's their, it's their yeah. It's, it's their story. We are there to help them have as successful journey as possible. Right. So if we can align different resources, because we're the experts in the constellation of resources 
that are available. If you've never needed any of these things, you wouldn't know where to get public benefits, what's available, what are the different programs. We know that. So we're able to be sort of that champion that can come in and say, hey, we've got your back. We're here to walk alongside you on your journey, but this is your, your journey, your story. And I think that we work really hard to make sure we don't perceive ourselves as some sort of knight that's come in, you know, with, you know, to, to save the day. That's not our role. Uh, we're there just to align the resources that support success. And very often you have clients who basically are are telling you, you know, there's this there's this cliche that is just not true. Clients are generally not saying, I want more. Mm. Right? Mm. Clients are generally saying, I want to be in a position where I can want less. I can right. do less, right? Because I don't want you in my business. I don't want to have to share, I don't want to have have you know oversight and and uh you know government compliance, audits of, of whatever, who, who needs that, right? I want less. Help me to use you less, right? Right. People want to be self-directed. People want to have the resources to make their own decisions. And remember, every time someone retells their story to another social worker or another caring leader, it's the possibility to relive the trauma that they're already experiencing. Who needs it? It's right. Exactly. Who needs it? I, I mean, I think... In many cases, folks want the support, but there are also folks who don't approach our organizations because they either don't know that they're eligible or, they, or they're afraid to ask. I mean, we saw this all the time. There are studies on this that people don't go to food pantries because they think either they're not bad off enough or someone is worse off than they are. So they don't want to take, you know, take the resources, even though the resources are there. We have this and I think this is really, this comes from leaders at different times who created images of who folks, who the folks who need our help are, that were incorrect and often racist and biased, deeply racist. And so as a result, people are not always seeking the help that our systems are set up to do. Um, we try to, through our outreach, make sure folks know that we're here and that there is a range of services available to help them um, because we all need help at different times. We all depend upon our communities to lift us up when we face struggles. Uh, and so we have to keep that in mind too. You know, I just recently read um, Poverty by America by Matthew Desmond. And one of the things that really st stood out to me is that all human beings get help from the government in different ways. But some people are looked down upon because they ask for help. And some people just assume that it's their due because of where they stand, you know, sort of by class. And really all of us, all of us need help. If I'm drilling for oil and I'm getting uh, a lease on a land at a much reduced rate. Right. right. So I'm not paying the government for that lease on the land, right? At a much reduced rate because the government feels like I need to drill oil, you know, make it available and yeah. uh, sell that oil, which is on this government lease land, the government is basically helping me, yes. helping me drill for oil. Absolutely. Yeah. That's and even okay. for, for all of us who own land and get a mortgage tax deduction, that's the government helping us too every single day. So we're all helped. Uh, and this myth of bootstrapping is just that. It's a myth. No one is bootstrapped. We all get different types of help. So um, I like to keep that in mind when we think about the type of work that we offer at organizations like Bill Wilson Center. So how do you ensure that, that money is efficiently spent? Because mm. one of the things that, is, that people are really concerned about um, is that uh, nonprofits that are taking in contributions, that they're efficient. And if I'm going to give, if I'm going to write you a check, I want to make sure that that money is put to good use. Now, if you're getting a government grant and I'm paying taxes and that government, I want to make sure, how do you make sure that that money is well spent? Because really, since everybody's so individual, yeah, you could provide an infinite amount of services and figure out a way to justify it, right? Uh, you know what I mean? So how do you how do you create that, that tension to, um, or, or is that even necessary to make, how, how do you deal with that, with that issue? So I think transparency is critical. 
and especially fiscal transparency as it relates to nonprofits. You know, we don't want to be the next nonprofit to be on the cover of the Mercury News and the New York Times because of some sort of malfeasance. So there's, there's a couple of things that I try to make sure that we are on top of. First of all, that we have, you know, tight financial review on a monthly basis of our performance and our uh and our operations and we're making smart decisions, always keeping in mind, is this best use of our resources? You know, if we were to have to report this out, would the community who's entrusted us to deliver on our mission feel like we were making smart decisions that help us deliver on what we say we're gonna deliver? So financial reporting analysis is important. Obviously clean audits, which we do on an annual basis are an important part of that to do as well. Training of all layers of management and staff as it relates to how spending, how to not even just what we're spending money on, but how we're thinking about our spending, what's influencing our decision-making as it relates to choices. And then also making sure that we're reporting out to our stakeholders at all the different levels. This is what we said we were gonna do. This is what we did. This is what it cost. And to just make sure that at all levels that we're consistent with what we say we're going to do, what our values are as an organization. I will say, and this might be unfairly so, you know, nonprofits are held to a higher standard than for-profit organizations. Uh, I mean, when you think about how much fat is built into, you know, your Starbucks latte, uh, and in some cases, you know, funders don't even consider that we need to make sure that we have enough additional revenue to have working capital for new ideas, but we're supposed to keep our prices as low as possible. We go to quote out contracts. Well, then how do you have working capital? Your your salary is published, right? Oh, yes. All those things. Yes. it's It's all transparent. It's all published. Right. Yes, of course. I mean, we do, we make sure that our reporting is strong so that people can feel confidence. We, I also try to build this in into the way we even talk about fundraising and solicitation so that it's very clear what we're doing, how we do it, why we're doing it, so people can feel that they trust when they make a donation to Bill Wilson Center. And do you also uh, measure your success in terms of the number of people served, the number of services offered, mm. those services? How, how do you or that that you're you're looking at real world individuals without treating people as if they're numbers because different people have different needs. I mean, qualitative difference is so much a part of what you're doing. How do you end up looking at at quantity mm. and ensuring that quality is also there, but you're not you're not overserving people who don't need it, rather right. and therefore depriving people who do. So, you know, throughput of individual clients is not typically uh, a number that I that I think is particularly valuable as long as we're meeting all of our individual contract obligations. I mean, we're we're heavily government uh, funded. More than 90 percent of our funding comes from government. And a lot of that is specific performance on contracts. So I certainly look at that. But for me, that's not that doesn't tell me, are we having the depth of impact that we that we need to have. So we look at different things than that. We look at um, we look at outcomes as it relates to housing. Who is still housed? You know, six months, one year, two years after completing a housing program, because that's a telling statistic. You know, we develop. We look at um, self sufficiency and moving forward on self sufficiency for clients. Um, that is a sort of an out come as opposed to an output. I try to look at them differently because for me, outputs are very basic. I mean, we can report out, we have a thousand beds of housing a night. You know, we know how, know how many clients are enrolled in our specific programs and how many we serve annually, but that doesn't tell me if we're moving the needle for individual clients. So we look at multiple different data sources. We also survey our clients annually to hear from them directly what have what have they what are their impressions what are their feelings what are they taking away we also work on a series of strategic plans that have specific outcomes associated for performance at all levels of the organization so we usually do a three year increment with one year operational plans so looking to see how close to meeting those plans are we are we moving the organization in the direction of and i look instead of broader deeper deeper impact mark for each individual person who comes through our doors. 
So do um, you subscribe to, to, you know, Booker Washington, Booker T. Washington uh, said something that I thought was just incredible. He said, I've learned that success is to be measured not so much by the position, position one has reached in life as by the obstacles which that person has overcome while trying to succeed. Uh, uh, do, you take a, do you take a page out of, out of Booker Washington's philosophy where you're, you're encountering people where they are and you're you're helping them evolve mm. in a different state and but you're paying attention to that evolution is that evolution being energized is it being enabled and do you get get to a point where you start to withdraw support as people become mm. uh, self activated and, and self empowered um or do you just keep keep investing oh. or resource, you know, regardless of the circumstance, how do you, how do you have, how do you make those decisions? So each person is on their own journey and journeys aren't linear. Some are, you know, one direction and a client just needs a couple of supports and is on their way. And then for some folks, you know, it's fits and starts. Some of this is really driven marked by the contract. So for example, rapid rehousing programs, which provide time-limited housing subsidies for clients. Most of those are one or two year programs and folks are not necessarily eligible to re-enroll after the one or two years is over. But, so that, that program might be time-limited as it is, but there might be other supports that can come into, the, into play after that ends that are sort of less, not quite as deep, but still provide that help towards self-sufficiency. It really depends on the individual. I think you're talking about like we do try to lower the stumbling blocks, minimize the barriers as much as possible, knowing all along that we are the support system to the person, as I said before, who is on the journey themselves. Most folks, you know, are not eligible to be on in any of our programs for more than two or three years. Um, and I would say the majority of folks are only coming in for a little bit here, a little bit there um, on an as needed basis. Uh, so really, it's about always meeting each person where they are and seeing of all the different interventions, opportunities, programs we have access to, what is the right portfolio of services to meet this person, as you said, where they are at that moment. So what I'm coming away from, Josh, is that uh, for, from this conversation is that what you're trying to do is to treat the person as if you are their support infrastructure. You're mm. their parents, you're their families, you're, you're encountering who they are. There's, there's a bit of tough love, but there's definitely love. Right, Absolutely. Support. And you're you're doing your best in a very complicated situation where there is no prescription. Mm -hmm. There is no blithe and easy answer. You're figuring it out with your clients um, as, as they're trying to figure it out themselves. Right. Yes, absolutely. You know, I think about a lot of this in the context of Maslow's hierarchy of need and that we're coming in and sort of the, the base of that where people are facing their most significant insecurities. And we're helping rally as many of those resources together so they have the opportunity to ascend to self-determination, to the deeper levels of human meaning. Um, and that looks differently for everyone. Uh, but we are proud to be able to join people where they are and help them reach that point in their lives. Well, Josh Sello, thank you so much for sharing the great work of the Bill Wilson Center. Please thank everyone who contributes in various ways, sometimes as volunteers, sometimes as staff, sometimes as board members, and as clients as well. One of the things that really is notable about it is this philosophy of self-actualization, of empowering uh, people, and, and your, your folks really do a fantastic job of it. Thank you so much for sharing your work. Thank you so much, Mark.